give the, the real introduction. Yeah, when we talk about hot cold data, which was the topic of today's talk, um, what we mean by that is the hot data has been updated recently. In the last n days, you define whatever your release case is. Cold data has not been ac accessed or updated recently. And so that's basically your historical data. The assumption also is that most queries will access hot data only. Typically 80, 90, if not 99% of, of your queries will do that. But there's a reason for the history, and you do want to keep the history in the same system with the hot data. So you want both together. You want to be able to access the history when necessary, but in the vast majority of cases, that's not the case, and you will just want to access your hot data. So the basic promise is cold data, in other words, history should be available. It shouldn't cost you a lot of extra money. And it shouldn't slow down the system very much. And when I go come back to talking a little bit more about the, the comparative, comparative landscape of how this is done, um, maybe I'll talk a little bit more on how, why I think I consider this kind of a form of scalability. But I think Raoul will give more of an overview of the business case and show for the, right. a little bit broader scope of the, of the use case. So what we are looking, right, if you look from the current mm -hmm. data models perspective, right, you have these different workload silos, right, where the operational side, which is mainly the hot data, where the data rapid ingestion is happening, and then you are trying to do real-time reporting. And as the data is getting colder, and again, you apply an ideal process, you move into, into another system, and then again to another system to do your analytics, right? If you look from that perspective, what are the problems? It's very high TCO. And then the reason why you have to do is because these systems are not scale, right? That's why yeah, you, uh, you are looking for a system which is not able to scale. And another thing is you have to do the data, right? You need to move the data, that means you're duplicating the same data again and again. And then not only, what, it's not just relational data anymore, right? You are bringing in other data, you are bringing in your uh, social media into this, right? And into the mixture, and the data is like, you can have a JSON or SMS structured data. And then you also, because of these different uh, 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 platforms, you need to have different, you need to train different people to support these platforms, right? And that's the challenges, we, current challenges we are seeing in the big data world, right? And then what the new approach is trying to do is, right, right you are trying to bring in the data, right? And then you, once, once your data is in, then you can build your solutions top of that, right? Which is basically is costing, there is low TCO. And then the other thing is there is not much scaling issue anymore because Hadoop, it's a proven that Hadoop can pretty much scale. And then any any solutions on that on top of that, uh, well written solutions can also save, uh, scale pretty well, right? And then what we are saying is because the data is in the same platform, right? Well, there could be a, a small data movement, but it's a complete reduced data movement, right? It's not we are not saying that you can completely avoid the data movement, but as your applications are building, maybe you need to build some projections for that, and then you are, you may have to move a little bit of data but within the same uh, platform, right? And also one of the beauties about this is like, well, you are bringing in structured, it's it's just a, it's just a data, right? And approach, right, where you have invested in the middle tier a lot of uh, money. For example, if you have a web sphere application where you have written using ODBC or JDBC, right? And then if you want to go, and then you want to reduce your migration efforts, right? So this particular having a standard APIs is going to provide you that benefit, right? So from from use cases perspective, there are many use cases, right? especially in context of a hard to cold data, right? For example, a financial industry, right? And then all your uh, transactional data is coming in, and then you are looking at, uh, uh, you, are, you want to do your um, daily reports, right? And then you want to if, uh, update your uh, data, it could be a, a could be a quarter of data, it could be a month of data, right? So that basically you're trying to update, you may be deleting, you're inserting, right? 
And that's where you're running a your, lot of your workloads. You're going against that, right? And then as your data is becoming colder, right? And then because you're not updating frequently, you want to move that to a colder storage, right? Where usually it is cheaper, right? It's not, you're not doing much of your operations in memory. You're, scared, you're, you're moving the data. Then. But what we are trying to do is from in the, in the IoT world, right, where a lot of data is coming in, and then interestingly, you can see in the IoT world, people are looking from transactions. And an example I can see, I can provide you is like a um, your uh, their onboard devices. They're putting in the cars these onboard devices, so that they're looking at your driving patterns, right? Where how often you're applying the brake and how how quickly you're speeding up, so that that data is being collected and then goes to your insurance and then based on the insurance your driving patterns they are going to charge you back right and not only that for example in case of the fleet management companies right where let's say like um, the fedex right they are also tracking their uh, driver patterns the reason because if they get into an accident right and then they they collect the data right when you're applying or when you get into accident they don't want to miss that particular event so that means they're wrapping a transactions around it, right? So that means their real ingestion of data is coming in within the transaction capabilities and then also you want to do real-time analysis. And then as the real-time analysis is happening is very interesting case uh, I heard from a, you know, from a, a, a beer company is there as, as um, you are deployed, the, the drivers are driving on the, uh, uh, right? They may, if they, let's say they have to deliver in 10 locations and then they're getting delayed. The guy, the, the, the operators looking at uh, the driving, the driver, right? They can tell them, skip these two stores because they already have inventory in place and then we can give them a 10% discount next time coming. So just skip them and then go to the next stop, right? Those are the things real time happening and also based on the historical data they're deciding. So for that, it makes sense having this hot and cold data. By the way, I have a device like this in my car. It gives me a smiley or a frowny for every trip I make. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, Hans. Yeah. Okay, so we talked earlier about scalability and Rahul well, mentioned some use cases like uh, telecommunications or or these, these trip computers. I mean, the trip that I made two years ago, I don't think is very interesting, but it would still be, nowadays, I mean, you have Hadoop because you want to store everything. You would never want to delete anything. So why do I say that this hot cold data has to do with scalability? In principle, of course, scalability, what it is, and basically is you pay for twice the hardware and you get twice the throughput. Sounds, of course, pretty straightforward, but unfortunately, that's not always the case. As you know, I mean, in many engineering applications, database applications, the answer is unfortunately, the answer of the engineer is unfortunately, no matter how much money you give me, I cannot do it. <laughs> and so it, I think for a company, it's actually very good to be able to just throw a proportional amount of money at a proportional workload. Having said that, so this is very, in general, this is a very good thing to have. Get twice the throughput for twice the money. But if, for your history, I think that's really not quite what you want. If I have a business and my business lasts 10 years, after 10 years, I don't want to spend 10 times as much on my computing resources. That's just not economical because the history is not worth that much. So for this type of story history, with what I said earlier, that most of your queries go after the recent data. I want more. I might be able to, and I have to, I mean, I have to spend for 10 times the storage. That, I think there's no way around that, maybe with compression. But maybe not the SSD storage, maybe I want spending this something cheaper. I certainly do not want to spend 10 times the compute power. It's simply not necessary for the history. Neither do I want to spend 10x on the network. So the multi-temperature, or hot cold design does this for you. That you basically pay, no, no is a little bit too much up, but almost no overhead, no extra money for storing your history. And in order to do this, you have to basically do, you have to 
separate the order and the call data from each other. And when you query, you have to make sure you don't actually have to access the call data. And the principle is pretty simple in all the databases. The answer is really partition. Um, if I have, instead of one sales table, I have really five partitions of my sales table, one for each year, and the user just wants to know the last year of sales, well, I don't never have to look at these green tables. And so they don't, they don't cost me, they cost me storage, but they don't cost me any CPU and networking um, resources. And it's the database's job to make this happen automatically. The database's job to look at this query and realize that it only has to look at these queries. It's very simple here, but if you've got a 17-way join, it's not quite so simple. You have to use a lot more sophisticated techniques to do this. So again, another thing, if you we talked earlier about Spark, Spark, you may have to do much of this yourself unless you use Spark SQL. But in SQL, it would be optimizable. I suspect the Spark SQL optimizable. So, okay, the answer is partitioning. But partitioning is really used for two different purposes today. And I think it's very important to, to keep in mind or always think about what, which of these we are talking about. One form is typically hash partitioning or the Hadoop folks call it salting. And that is the reason for this kind of partitioning is almost the opposite of what we talked about with hot code. I want to spread my data as much as I can over all the nodes in a cluster. And it's typically done with hash partitioning. When we talk about range or list partitioning, that is typically the type of partitioning that is used for hot and cold data, where the range partitioning separates the hot data on one end from the cold data on the other end of, of my data. Um, yeah, and so if I have a query, the hash partitioning makes sure the query can use the maximum amount of parallelism. It can run on every node. The hot cold scheme makes sure that I'm only reading part of the data. And also, of course, it allows storage hierarchy, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you want, some of it is just comes automatically because if you read only part of the data, you're putting less strain in your cache. The other one that you may actually really use different terms of, of secondary storage, such as disk or SSD. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how common database systems address this problem. And this is one thing where, where you can see that this is an important problem, that virtually every database system that you see out there has addressed this. And sometimes at great cost, I know some people in Microsoft SQL Server, they spent a huge amount of work on this, or I used to work at IBM for a while, and they also spent some millions of dollars implementing this feature. And you see that it's really partitioning. So in the left column, you generally see hash partitioning, different flavors of it. Sometimes it's built in. Teradata is no, you cannot not have hash partitioning. It's, it's a must in Teradata. Um, the Fortean has this, in general, of course, HBase automatically splits your table into multiple regions. If that works for you, that's great. Sometimes you have a hotspot in your key space and you use salting including a hash value to um, spread the data even. It's actually something we pretty much do similar to Phoenix, the, the Salesforce project that they did this as well. If, yeah, I don't really need to go into all of this. SQL Server doesn't really have a great solution, but the other ones do. Um, in Hive, what happens is that you don't have syntax feature or partitioning feature to spread your data over the cluster. It just happens, you just take your blocks and you just randomly place them on the cluster and that achieves this, this parallelization. So for hot cold, we also have partitioning but no range. The Oracle, for example, is really cool. Um, it's the same mechanism, it's a partitioning mechanism, but they allow you to hash partition, to range partition, and also to hybrid partition and mix the two. So you can achieve both. SQL Server has range partitioning, as I mentioned, DB2, they 
implemented this. Now Teradata and Trafordian HBase take a slightly different approach. In part, it was just because it was easier for us. Rather than having separate partitions, our table have a, a key space, basically a B3 of values. And what these two systems do, Teradata calls it partition primary index, Trafordian calls it division index, basically just allow us to have a prefix column in our key that has a very low, a large granularity um, value of where my data is, let's say, for a month. So I don't want in, in my prefix of my key to have the timestamp of my sales transaction because that means I couldn't use that key for anything else. And typically, that's not what I want. I want to have I want to access my sales table by product or customer or store or something like that. So in order to do both, what I want is I want the key both on the date and also on let's say store. And to do this is that I have two key columns, the month of the date plus the store ID. And because there are so few months, it works. And you need some special techniques to do this. Jordan calls this MDAM um, to allow single key to really give you an index of two columns with not a lot of different values. And finally Hive, yeah, I mean, you probably have worked with Hive partitions. It works fine and it has this partition pooling. Partition pooling. The only drawback with Hive is that you have to have one partition for every column value. So we ran to PCDS. Date, the data is spread over 1800 days. So you have to have 1800 partitions fairly unmanageable. And even I struggles with that. Um, yeah, I think we talked about most of this already. As I mentioned, the salty is a hash value prefix. We actually have three prefixes, or three columns in our key now. The salt first, right through the data, the divisioning column second, which is kind of the month of the, or the week, you can pick whatever you like. And then the third column is the actual column that is valuable to the user. And um, yeah, I think we pretty much did this. Yeah, one thing is your query engine, of course, will have to automatically generate predicates on this. The user is not going to deal with the salt and the division. In fact, they don't even see it. The SQL user does not see it, look at these columns. So the system automatically has to update them and have predicates on them. Okay, so now I wanted to swing around a little bit. This was all talking about systems. But I think the DBA, if you design your application, you can really do a few things to help this. Because I've seen many times that the databases that people had really didn't have any heart and call to that. They're not designed to have this. And it's, sometimes it's okay. I mean, not, all, not every database fits into this pattern, but if possible, I would recommend to any DBA to try very hard to design a time component into their database. When they have fact tables, big tables in, in SQL, try to have them based on time. And when you design um, user interfaces, try to design them in a way that the user interface is aware of time. So for example, by default, Query gives you the last year of your sales data. Only if you ask for it can you get more. And I think that really improves overall performance and cost to implement the system. You can improve it quite a bit. The other thing is, I think as a database designer, I need to worry. I should have this principle that what I consider cold data is immutable. So there must not be any more updates on it. This way I can store it in, in write only, and write once, read multiple times files such as org or k. The other thing is that, okay, now I've done all these things. I have a time component, I have hot calls, but now what? My hot call boundary is going to move. So if I store one, if my hot data is one month, every month I will have to move a month from the hot to the cold. And so that's also something that needs to be designed. And I think this can be done online. 
So with a little bit of care, um, we recommend a view that basically is a union between the hot and the cold data. And then you can move the data from hot to cold, move it to a cheaper storage. And you also have to design a process by which you really age out the value of this data. Sometimes after 10 years, it's really not interesting anymore and you want to get rid of it. So yeah, that, those are basically the, the checklist for the, the DBA. And I think okay. that pass it on, pass it back to Ralph. So what we are saying, right? Uh, so what we are saying is, with our solution, you could uh, achieve this, right? So what we want to show is transparently, right? So let's say, from an, any, any, as I talked, right? Most of use cases are falling into this bucket, right? Where you are getting stream, right? Streaming of data, it could be structured, semi-structured, unstructured. The data is coming in, so it could be through Kafka stream or any of the streams which are very popular, right? So as the data is coming in, right? So what we try to do is we keep this data in HBase. And the reason we, we leverage HBase is you can update your data, right? And then at the same time, right? The HBase is really efficient like for the real time query because the data set is small, right? So you can run your queries, right? Because your scans are very sh uh, short scans. So you can keep this and then you can run your queries, right? So what we are saying is, like what we are trying to achieve is, let's say when you are creating a table, right, you can say, well, I want to create my table, then you can say what kind of a table, it could be a hot table or a cold table, or it could be a combination of hot and cold. So once we have this, right, you can also, as Hans was saying, that you can set a time frame, right, I want to keep my data for a quarter in hot, and then as the data is become colder, I want it to move transparently, right? So. As the data is, right, we have the hard data, and then we move the data into ORC, right? And then this is in, in the optimized uh, row column format, which is like mainly good for to do your you know, analytical queries, right? So the data moves in. But from the end application perspective, they don't have to worry. To them, it looks like a single table, right? So as I Hans pointed out, right, based on your way predicates, it knows where to find the data. Either the data is here or the data is here, right? But most of the queries, right, as because you're only accessing most of the time the hot data, so it will be going after this. And then because the data set is small, HBase can provide you a good uh, capabilities, right? You could do, because your data set is small, so short scans are enough, right? But as the data is becoming older, where you may want to keep, let's say, you, you want to keep one year of the data and then you want to keep one quarter of the data in, in hot and then rest of the data you want to transition into ORC, you can keep the three quarters of the, three quarters of the data here, right? But you should be able to join them together, just in, in case, right, where you are saying, see, right, you're running, you want to do some machine, uh, uh, machine learning on the, on the right, historical data so that you can apply your predictive analytics, right? So, but, what you are seeing at the real use cases is the combination. So people are saying like, it's we want everything to happen, right? As the data is coming in, we want at the real time look at the historical data to the actions, right? For example, in case of uh, Spark, right? It's always a sliding window. They call it the Spark stream, right? But you need to build that, and then then you need to do some analysis on that, right? So what we are saying is, in our case, it is we could achieve that in this combination where you're combining your your real-time data with your historical data, right? And you could have any of these presentation layers looking at this, right? You could, uh, most of the tools, right, I think, right now, an Apache project called Zeppelin, which is very equal to Tableau, right? And then very popular, they leverage this to do some of the data analysis, right? And uh, that's where we are, uh, we are trying to achieve, right? Where we want to provide a mechanism at the at when you are creating your defining your DDO. So how do you want to keep your data, right? You want to your hot data and cold data are together, and then in a single table, right? And that's what, uh, right? And that's and that is the reason because we are, we can integrate with different storage layers in this case, and then we can also federate, so it becomes a transparent to the application. 
So you want to get an experience and then as, uh, you can download the software and play with it. So one point as Hans mentioned out, right, we, this project is open source project. It's in Apache called Travodium. But we also for uh, uh, we also have some differentiations uh, for an SGDB where we provide a manageability layer and some of the other features, and um, and that's why that's a proprietary. But the rest of the uh, uh, source is all open source. That's all I have. Thank you. Cool. So uh, exciting topic, huh? Yeah, exciting yeah. topic. Yeah. They, I, I'm thinking like if pe uh, folks who are looking at these uh, these use cases mm -hmm. will, uh, I think we'll have a lot of, uh, we could do probably next time when when it's not uh, raining or, <laughs> 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 right. right. So uh, from a uh, most important benefit point of view, if you combine both hot and cold data, what do you think that is number one thing people should really consider doing it? Because it is kind of a challenging the status quo. Right today, you have multiple databases, and you're pretty happy. If you are a DBA, Oracle DBA, you don't want to lose the, <laughs> you know, the server instances because you may lose your job. So, what do you think is the number one benefit which you see available? One of the um, yeah, the biggest benefits um, I keep hearing, at least from the use case plus, right, the footprint, right, the, the data center footprint, right. People are. One of the challenges they're having is like, okay, I build this data center, I'm using this particular technology, right? But my concurrency is very low, right? So suppose you want to um, run a lot more queries, right? And then right now, the only mechanism people are saying is, okay, scale out your infrastructure so that you can get your right. So again, they want, this could be because of the hot data where they're building all the cache as Hans pointed out, but that's pretty expensive, right? And all it could be data in the core data, right? Well, then the questions they're asking is, well, if without increasing my, uh, my capacity, can I double my um, uh, throughput or workloads, right? So those are the challenges, right? That's, that, will, that is going to happen more and more when they're bringing these data sets together, when the workloads together. Because, as the, both the workloads are coming in together, so now the uh, now the only alternative is to expand your platform, right? And to expand the platform, then you need to have infrastructure to do that, right? So can we do? And that is where we are saying that we can differentiate. So with you can within the data set because we are reducing the data movement, and then we can limit your infrastructure. You can also increase your concurrency. Yeah. yeah one thing that I is the simplicity that you bring right, to to the data center. Correct. The more number of instances, the more number of them. It goes back to your the picture that you showed before, where you know, building up individual components that that looks good and on paper. You you know you bring your own TN, you bring your own Phoenix, and you bring your own uh, compiler bring it all together and it seems like on paper, best of breed solution, so it should all work really well. Right. But in reality it doesn't. It doesn't. And especially when you're in a production environment, you don't want a lot of moving parts and then trying to coordinate the SLAs, the, all of that. Correct. How do you, how do you optimize that? Right. Yes. And you, you get rid of all of that by putting in one Correct. solution. True, true. Actually, especially what we um, what we also observe is some of these solutions, right, are not good at, um, they may be good at reads, right, and they were not good at when you are doing a writes, right. So typically, for example, Spark, right, some of the things, right, you load the data and then you run your queries, right. In a mixed, but in a real world, that's not how it will be, right. You, you, people are looking for a mixed workload, especially in this context, right, where your ingestion is happening and then you want to do the reporting, right? So when you are bringing these together, then you are, de then you are competing against your SLAs, right? So a, a customer can say, one of the customers can say, my, my, my ingestion is, is the highest priority compared to my real-time reporting or historical data. But on the same platform, 
if and that is why you are segregating your workloads as as atanu was pointing out right so when you you are simplifying things right it is good to have simplifying things but you need to still achieve your sls and that's the, that is one of the challenges which we can we, we think we can really provide that Any questions? Comments? Questions? So I know you started using a little bit of a spark. So what was what is the use case? Uh, in your uh, case? No, this was when uh, this was previously when I worked on uh, as an internet fire and we were doing fire. Like, uh, okay. Okay. Some analytics on uh, real time uh, log data. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, that's when we spark it. Data that was coming in, and we had to detect some specific threat. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. That's yeah. Um, okay. So, and if you have, uh, so if you have existing data, so how, so you you can uh, you can integrate with this solution and differentiate it into hot and cold data. Right? Existing data is typically if it is not being updated. Uh, Right? Yeah. It's a it's a cold data, cold right? Data. So you are just doing a querying and right? Yes. Right. So if we are updating, then yeah, it's, so you can move it into hot data, and okay. then you can keep updating, right? Yeah. So if if something is like say in Postgres SQL or something, uh, and the data is coming in, you can plug it in to this and integrate the Correct. rest to yes. right. store it in different clusters and. Right. So in our case, you don't need Postgres is what we are saying, right? It's like actually just like a Postgres. So right. if, if, for example, currently we have an application which is already, you know, so entrenched in using Postgres, SQL and all that, then how do you? Yeah, so usually Postgres is ANSI SQL, right? Yeah. It's mostly standard SQL. So unless it is using some proprietary, um, uh, like, right? So typical uh, uh, the way we propose is just like an Oracle or, or right. As long as um, your application is written using JDBC or ODBC, okay. it should work, uh -huh. right? Because you're just pointing to a standard SQL. But any variations, right? One of the things what we try to provide is we have like a stored procedures. You can make conversion. For example, in case of an Oracle, if you have a PL SQL, so usually it gets converted into SPJ, stored procedures, and you can run them, right? So any variations, or you have to rewrite your queries. Mm -hmm. So that's how it should. My answer would also be, I mean, if, if you could use Postgres and it works fine for you, and the single node limitation that it has, not a problem for you, it's probably okay. Yeah. But if you are feeling that the one node is not enough for you, then, think then it's a good idea. Same goes for myself. So if you are looking for like, let's say more than four nodes, I think it's uh, best to move to Hadoop, right? And that's right. That's the value add, right? Especially if you're scaling out and the data, variety of data, and then uh, those are the things uh, that we, the solutions, right? Yeah. yeah, we do have a Docker image. It can, you can run it on your laptop, right? And then it's like, a, you can download it and then run it. Yeah, and play with it. But it's uh, Hadoop is a heavy stack, right? You have the file system, Hadoop, and then you have Matter, you have about, like uh, other infrastructures comes into the play, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah, yeah. So Java, Java comes in with his own uh, bells and whistles, right? Like JVMs and <laughs> memories, right? And our code is all written in C, C++. So when we only accessing this, we do the transition, right? Yeah. Yeah. So do you have any numbers in terms of uh, comparisons with any other uh, SQL databases? I think, yeah, we, we have, we run both the benchmarks, right? We ran all the benchmarks like TPC EC for transaction workloads, TPC DS. I think, yeah, we have in our website, I think we're going to put them in our website so people can come and look at it. And uh, pretty good actually, yeah. So. As compared to high and Impala, we do pretty well in the in the DS yeah, decision support uh, benchmarks. Yeah. What are some architectural reasons why you guys do well? 
Well, as I, as uh, as Hans, Hans pointed out, as I pointed out, especially like for example, the parallelism, right? We scale pretty well, and then uh, the uh, the pushed on predicates, and then our uh, optimizer, mm -hmm. right? And then it, it's a twenty year twenty year old optimizer, right? And then it, uh, uh, those are the differentiations. The richness, right? uh, richness to, compared to higher and farther, correct? But they don't have. There are some of these curves that are 30, 40 way joints. Joints, so pretty yes. Challenging. Yeah. Right, I guess all the features, like I was saying, group wise and order by, we like, well, it's our, our, our differentiations, right? right? So that's why, yeah. Right. And then, see, some of the things is also, right, it's, you see, the bench, running benchmarks is one thing, right? It's not in the real workload, it's not benchmark. You should also consider looking from the concurrency perspective. You need to also look from the scale perspective, right? So maybe you, for, for right now, your workload, you may, your data set is maybe only four nodes, right? But you should also account as you are growing, you need to have a scalar architecture, right? And then also um, are a databases for support mixed workload, right? For example, in case of you're just doing a, a, a reporting perspective, yes, maybe some engines can run well, but it's, that's not the real use case, right? Where you're also in, inserting the data, ingestion, right? Then it's a mixed workload. And then how, how are the engines work together, right? And then the concurrency, as you're deploying more and more applications, so the engine should be able to capable to um, support those. So those are the things uh, you need to look around. Well, uh, any other questions? Great. Well, thank you very thank much, you. Hans and uh, Rao, and I uh, really appreciate it.